that you should know. And we do have ID guides that really whittle that list down to what's important for like our citizens to look for and then our partners and staff too. So I've got a hyperlink to the NR40 fact sheets at the top and that gives a description of each of the species that we we list in NR40. And then there's a hyperlink to the Citizen Lake Monitoring Early Detector Handbook, um, which is a great handbook with pictures. It's very easy to, to follow. Um, it gives you an idea of what to look for. Um, and then we have a hyperlink to um, a webinar that we hosted yesterday um, that went through the species ID review. We went through submersed aquatic plants, um, aquatic and wetland animals, riparian plants, and upland wetland plants. So there are four different presenters. It's a pretty comprehensive um, PowerPoint, and then we, can, we broke it out um, if you were only interested in one species group. You can learn that way. Um, and then we also ask folks that are out monitoring, know what's in the water body that is where you're going to be looking. Um, and we do this for two different things because you'll know what's already known in that water body and you'll know if there's something that we don't know is present. And then if you're looking and want multiple water bodies, you'll know what's there to remind yourself you don't want to move that to another lake and you have a better idea of what to do to clean your equipment before going to another water body. And I have just two links, one for our mapping tool, which is the interactive map. You can pan around and turn layers on and off. And then there's tabular data. So you can look up a water body within a county and it has a list of what invasives are in it. And I'll have screenshots of what both of those look like later in the PowerPoint. Oh, and here's just a screenshot of the Citizen Lake monitoring um, cover of their early detector handbook. Um, so everybody who's out monitoring, when they do find things, we ask them to report it. And we have a website that talks about how to, how to report. And we've got different tabs for um, aquatic, shoreland, and wetland. And then there's a tab for terrestrial and then more information about the NR40 species. Um, but you just go to the DNR website and search the word invasives. And this is the first page that will pop up when you click on that link. Um, and we have staff I highlighted in, in red that this is the report page. And then I highlight for the aquatic and wetland, we ask that you report it to your regional DNR AIS coordinator. And I'll explain why. So all the folks that are signed up for a program enter their monitoring results into SWIMS, whether they find something or not, because it's important to have those non-detects too. We keep track of that, like where we know where your Asian water milfoil is. We also know where it isn't, where we did look and have some confidence that these species aren't found there. Um, we enter our planned field work events into SWIM. Sorry for the acronym, but that's the Surface Water Integrated Monitoring System. It's our internal database within water quality. Um, we use it for a lot of our EPA reporting for the Clean Water Act, but then we also put our invasive species records in there. Um, we've been doing this for I think since the mid 90s, probably. Um, and then for unplanned field work events and somebody who doesn't work with swims, which not everybody does, and that's okay. Um, we have incident reports. It's just a short form that we can fill in and provide to, to the regional DNR. Um, and they can enter that into swims for you. And the incident report is linked on that previous report page. You can get a PDF of it. Um, we also ask the people out monitoring to collect photos and specimens for verification. Um, photos are, we desire more for, we always ask that for a photo because photos are very easy to email. And if you take a good photo, which is what Paul is going to talk about, um, we can identify most all invasive species based on the photo. And we send those to the regional DNR AIS coordinator. And we ask that you collect a specimen just in case it wasn't such a good photo and in case the DNR needs them for another reason, whether for if they need to take a closer look or if there's a reason we want to voucher that species. It's easier if the person who's out in the field can just collect that specimen right away, put it in a Ziploc bag in their fridge until they hear from the DNR whether they need that or not. And here's a, a map of who those regional DNR AIS coordinators are. Um, so you see the color, color codes around the state. Um, 
for there and you find those names through that report website. You won't see this map exactly, but you'll see um, their names listed out in which counties they cover. And then to let you know we're not flying by the seat of our pants, um, we do have a response framework that we use when we find new detections of invasive species. You can find that through our DNR website by searching invasive response framework. Um, this is department wide, so it's more than just water quality. Um, forestry had input and this, and it's just a guide that tells us sort of step by step things that we don't forget um, when we find an important new discovery. Um, we have a plan and we know how to move forward. Within the response framework, um, the aquatic invasive species, so in water quality, we do have a specific communication protocol that helps guide water quality staff. Um, and these are where you see the blue lines, they are hyperlinks. You can really only access through that this publicly through that response framework. So you should be able to, to find it, but it's a little bit clunky to get through. We're trying to make it more streamlined on our, on our external websites. Um, but we have links for where to know what species are present, um, how to report them. Um, and then just a step-by-step, -step, and this talks about under a report, it talks about how to enter the data into SWIMS, and then also has a link to the incident report and talks about submitting specimens. Um, the back page of the communication protocol just as guidance for that regional AIS coordinator. So the regional AIS coordinator um, will work on getting the taxonomic experts. So our verifiers to verify the species um, and update the status guidance and create the records. And I highlight here about the verification process because um, even though not everyone needs to know, it's still helpful to know that we have a process outline that all of our staff follow. Um, and the flow chart gets, goes on and gets more complicated talking about whether it's NR40 restricted or prohibited, how we handle that and how we communicate new discoveries outward. We let a core group of people know and then we of course let the local lake association know and then we've thought through this um, pretty uh, detailed so that we don't forget anybody that needs to know when there's a new discovery. But then for the verification process, um, DNR, oh I'm not plugged in. <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> Um, DNR trained and tested staff and some partners around the state and whether or not how skilled they are at identifying invasive species and, and we tested them, we passed some, we didn't pass some others. So we've got a list, an internal list that we do not share publicly. All non-DNR people need to know is that your one contact is your regional DNR AIS coordinator and your regional DNR AIS coordinator confirms that ID with two other verifiers. Um, the verifiers could be the collector themselves if they took this test. Um, maybe there were two collectors out in the field that day that they were both verifiers. Maybe the regional AIS coordinator is a verifier. They just send the picture to somebody else. Um, but it's been working pretty well. We've been doing it for, for a few years and it's really streamlined the process for us. Um, once two verifiers agree, the regional DNR AIS coordinator will create the record in SWIMS, our database, um, which then automatically populates within 24 hours our tabular and spatial websites, and I'll show you what those look like. So you can go to our DNR website and you can find what any, in, like where the invasive species are located. If this is our lakes, rivers, and wetlands, um, with aquatic invasive species, you can search by water body. You can, this drop down at the top, you can drop down and select just by county and it will name the water body in the county and then just lists out what invasive species are in it. So before you go to a water body, you know what's already known in it. So you'll know if you find something new. Then we also have a website where you can search by species location. You can click, here's what the main page looks like. You can click on the different species and then it'll show you, you can list it by county or by water body. It'll show you that uh, this is for Asian clam. We're found in Bonners Lake in Racine County. Um, and I think down here is what year it was discovered. So we have all of our data that populates our website. Um, we also have a mapping tool 
where you can turn on and off these layers. This is only showing you the plants. We also have different layers for the surface waters and boat landing access points and things like that. Um, so you can see tabularly and you can turn all these layers on. They're going to cover up each other, but it's pretty useful um, to be able to see what's already known in, in water bodies. Um, and again, here's that map of where our regional AIS coordinators are. Oh, this might be it for my PowerPoint. Yeah, so this is my ending slide. Um, I always love using this. I, I got a card once that with this on it, just these little kids with snorkels on. Um, part of our early detection surveys that the DNR does, we do a lot of snorkeling and sometimes not in so glorious lakes, but I thought this was a cool picture because it says life is easier when you've got a posse. We all did it together. It was fun, but not always fun. Um, so that's it from me, Paul. I'll stop sharing and you can share your screen. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. So uh, what I'll be talking about today is some tips on taking good photographs for the purpose of verification of an invasive species. And I'll be going through some common, um, common issues that we see with photographs that are sent to us that cause them to be uh, insufficient for identifying what's in the photograph or uh, makes it really difficult for us. So if you were on our webinar yesterday, you probably saw uh, two of these slides already. Um, but one, one of the things that we look for in the photo is to have not only a sense of scale in the photo, but also some information within the photograph. So if you can include a data sheet or a label like this one that we provide to people uh, as part of the Citizen Lake Monitoring Network, it has a lot of the information that we need for the specimen included right in the photograph. Sometimes pictures that just have that information in the file name get changed when they get downloaded or shared, and we may lose the information about where that picture was actually taken. So we prefer that some sort of label or data sheet is in the photo itself, so it cannot be separated from the actual specimen. So these labels here that you see on the screen are waterproof, tearproof labels that we provide as part of the volunteer AIS monitoring uh, component of the Citizen Lake Monitoring Network. Um, when you take a picture of an invasive species, whether it's one on a label here or a, a whole stand of something or um, the whole population, we ask that you send those photos to your DNR AIS coordinator. And again, referring back to Maureen's map that she just showed, those are the people that you would be sending the, the pictures to. The DNR AIS coordinator will then work with those verifiers to get a, a confirmation of the ID and will request a specimen if needed. So we request that you keep the specimen in a fridge or a cooler for a few days until you hear back from the DNR AIS coordinator just in case they need to see that actual specimen. If it's a fairly common species, one of our restricted species, then the photograph should be adequate and we, we probably will not need any kind of live specimen or preserved specimen. But if it's a prohibited species, that's a higher priority. And whether it's a plant or animal, the DNR AIS coordinator would likely request that specimen so it can actually be housed in an herbarium or a museum as an official voucher specimen. Photos are preferred if possible uh, for these restricted species because we have a lot of them. Many of these species are fairly widespread. The mystery snails, for example, we have about 1400 populations that are known across the state between the two mystery snail species. That's a lot of specimens for a museum to store um, just for our, our purposes. So in cases like that where it's a, a specimen that's easy to distinguish by a photograph and there's a lot of them, photos are a, an easier way and a more efficient way of verifying those populations. So when you take a voucher photo, uh, we need to make sure that the subject is in focus. If it's not in focus, it makes it really hard to see the distinguishing characteristics and actually verify anything based on the photograph. And one of the common things that we see is that the image is blurry because someone tried to get too close. And if you're beyond the, the focal length capability of your camera, 
then you just can't get that close. Uh, you'll often also block out a lot of light. So the, the photos end up being blurry and dark and it's just really difficult to tell what the subject of the photo is. So um, we ask that you take multiple photos from different angles and if, if one or two of them don't turn out really good, then hopefully a, a third or a fourth one will turn out better and we'll be able to tell what it is. And if you know what you're trying to show in the photograph, like in the left example, we have a rusty crayfish and the tips of the claws and the rust spot on the side are important identification characteristics. So if you can show those two features clearly in the photograph, then it makes it very easy for someone to pull that photo up and within seconds say, yes, that's definitely a rusty crayfish. Same example uh, on the right, we have a Eurasian milfoil whorl of leaves. We have a, a whorl of four around the stem, which is common to Eurasian milfoil. We have leaves that are clearly divided into more than 12 pairs of leaflets on each leaf. So it makes it very easy to tell which species that is. Also, if you can take a couple of landscape level photos, that helps us to show the extent of the population and also the context of that population in the landscape. Where is it relative to different landmarks? How tall is it? How extensive is the population? Are there other plants growing with that species? Um, that sort of thing. It's, a, it's important to know that as well. If you are taking uh, landscape level photos, try not to photograph people on their property or something like that. Um, most people are, are not real appreciative when there's just random people taking their picture. Um, so we try not to photograph a lot of private property or people if that's possible. And also try to include the data sheet or the label in the photo. And again, this is gonna be a little bit more challenging with a landscape level photo, because if your camera is focusing on a data sheet that's six inches away and the plant you're photographing is 60 feet away, it's gonna be hard for the camera to keep both of those in focus anyway. Uh, if you're zoomed all the way out, that might be more possible, but if you're doing any kind of zooming, it's gonna be really tough for your camera to do that. So do it when it is possible, realizing that it's not always going to be possible to do that. So now I'll get into some of the common causes of poor photographs that we've received. Um, one of the common things that we see is that um, somebody sees a plant and they just immediately pull out the picture, uh, pull out a camera and take a picture of it, uh, not thinking about where the light is coming from. And uh, this is, you're pretty flexible in, in where the light is coming from, but the one thing you don't want to do is point the camera basically right at the sun. If the sun is, is within the frame, then you tend to get these light flares that are caused by aiming the camera at a light source, uh, in this case, the sun. So you can see how washed out the top part of the photograph is here. And even throughout most of the frame, there are these streaks of bright spots across the frame. And so that can mute the colors or textures of a subject in your photo and uh, make it less valuable as a verification photo. So if you just turn around and have it roughly behind you or even to the side, you can eliminate that issue pretty easily. Another thing we see is that the background is very distracting. So if you have a lot of plants or other animals or uh, a very complicated background for whatever reason, it also makes it a little tougher to see maybe the edges of the specimen or where one plant starts and another one ends, that sort of thing. So if you can have a background that's fairly solid, that usually makes for a better picture. And the one you can see on the screen here is an Asian clam with a zebra mussel attached to it uh, when I was snorkeling and that was found in a lake. There was a lot of other vegetation and other things on the bottom. So just simply rising up a few feet from the bottom and taking a picture with more of just a, a bland uh, background of the water made for a much better photograph where you can clearly see the subject rather than a lot of distracting elements in the background. Another thing you can do if you're out, say you're on the roadside uh, or in a ditch and there's a lot of vegetation there, it may be hard to isolate one plant next to a whole bunch of other stuff, but you can move a couple of plants aside next to the one that you're trying to photograph. You could use your hand or a clipboard or a backpack, something like that behind the, the specimen to give it a more solid background and isolate it a little bit from all the other distracting things. Um, 
if you have something that's just in your hand and uh, you are in the parking lot or something or at a boat landing, you could use your car or a boat or something as the background. But uh, trying to have a more solid background that's not anything very distracting or exciting will generally make a better photograph to show that subject. And this one we mentioned a little bit already. Um, the subject is out of focus. This is pretty common that we see photographs that are not very well focused. Uh, it could be a lot of different causes, but it could be poor lighting. It could be the settings on your camera. It could be that you're too close. Um, it could be that you're just moving too much. So all those things could cause this. One of the easy things to do is move the camera a little bit farther away and try again. It could just be that you're trying to get too close to a snail or a close-up of a plant feature. And move the specimen into better light if you can. If you have more light, you will have a faster shutter speed on the camera and it'll be able to, to get you a more crisp photo. In some cases, you may actually want to use a cell phone or other flashlight to try to provide light. Um, you may not, maybe it's a really cloudy or stormy day or something and you don't have much light to work with. You could pull out your phone and illuminate something if you want to do it that way. And that should give you a better photo as well. So even on bright sunny days, sometimes your photo can be very dark on your subject. And a lot of times that is because the background is too bright. And the cameras these days have automatic light meters where they typically evaluate the whole frame and they kind of take an average of the intensity of light across the whole frame. And so if you have this dark colored snail in the center that takes up three or four percent of your frame and the rest of it is this bright overcast sky or something, the camera is going to bump the exposure of the whole picture down. It's going to make the whole thing darker to try to expose all that bright sky correctly. And what that really does for you is um, it makes your subject extremely dark. And it may be a useless photograph because you can't see anything. And what you've really captured is more or less a silhouette of your subject. So something you can do in that case, one, don't hold it up to a, a very bright background like an overcast sky. Hold it up uh, with a, a darker background or again it could be your hand or a notebook or your car or something like that or another thing you can try is to use the spot meter function on your camera even a lot of cell phones have light metering settings now um, certainly most cameras do even very basic cameras typically have a couple of light metering settings so the one you see on the screen there that little icon is the spot meter that the icon is basically outlining the whole frame and then the spot is indicating where the light evaluation is going to happen. So it evaluates how bright something is in just the center of the photograph. And if that's where your snail is, for example, then the camera will automatically change its settings to expose the snail correctly and not worry about anything in the background. So your background could be all washed out, but as long as you've got the snail, uh, illuminated properly and exposed properly, then it'll work for a verification photo. All right, sometimes we see uh, on shoreline plants in particular that the lighting is really modeled uh, coming through the tree canopy. So you've got these very bright spots and then you've got these dark spots right next to them. And that makes it a challenge as well because it's half the plant is gonna be well lit, half the plant is not well lit. So one of the things you can try is to use your shadow, or if you have somebody else with you, you can have them cast a shadow over your plant when you're taking a picture of it, or maybe even holding up some item to provide a small shadow. Um, that way, it is gonna darken th the frame a little bit, but uh, at least things will be evenly lit. And again, you could try a flashlight or, um, or just bumping up the exposure on your camera to illuminate it a little bit better. Uh, white balance is also a common problem. This Most cameras have an automatic white balance setting that, that people tend to leave it on. It does a fairly good job. Uh, the camera is basically guessing what kind of light you currently have. But there's most cameras have this, these manual settings as well. So you could 
manually change it if you go outside or if you're moving into the shade or if you have artificial light, there's different settings that match up with that. And it basically tells the camera what white looks like and the camera can, uh, can uh, appropriately show all the other colors based on what the, the white looks like. And it can get more complicated than that, but we'll leave it there. So basically, uh, if you take your specimen into the house or you put it in your garage and turn the lights on or whatever you do, uh, you're, you're using a different kind of light than what you'd have outside. And those lights are uh, different colors. You may notice when you look into somebody's house at, at, uh, in, in the evening, the light looks kind of yellow. Um, a lot of incandescent lights are very yellowish. Fluorescent lights and LEDs are uh, often more toward blue or a daylight spectrum. So the color of the light can impact what the color of your subject ends up looking like. So change that to be appropriate to what you are actually using for your light source. Another issue is a photo like this. Uh, there are a couple snails in the foreground that I can identify as abandoned mystery snail, but if, if those ones weren't there, then it would be really tough to see what kind of snails those are. Um, for all we know, they could be rocks or pine cones. Um, so you need to make sure that whatever subject you're trying to photograph, there is enough uh, feature showed in that specimen that you can identify it. This would be an acceptable landscape level shot to show there are a lot of snails in this particular lake uh, that all look to be the same. And then a close up photo that accompanies this one that clearly shows it's a banded mystery snail would, would be great. Cause then we get a lot of information about the extent of the population and how dense it is. And uh, if there are other snails or other animals that tend to occur with these and then also have a close-up for ID purposes. All right, uh, we also see a lot of very pixelated images come in. Um, sometimes they're surrounded by this border of blue or purple, and that's, that's a photography term called chromatic aberrations. It basically uh, imparts this, these colored lines around some things in the photograph, especially when a lot of zoom is being used. And it can be even worse when you're using digital zoom. So most cameras nowadays have optical zoom and digital zoom options. Digital zoom really is just cropping the image within the camera. And uh, what it's doing is it's making the pixels bigger and uh, it makes it more of a, a grainy image. Uh, the, the, the resolution of the image is, is reduced. So I would recommend only using optical zoom. Don't don't zoom in to the full extent of your camera or your phone because a lot of times after it uses up its optical zoom abilities and it's starting to use digital zoom and it, you're getting a little bit closer, but really you're just uh, reducing the quality of the image as you go further in. So move closer to the subject physically if you can um, because the digital zoom is, is not likely to make things, uh, make for a very good photograph. All right. Uh, that is all I have. So we were hoping that we'd leave a few minutes here for questions about the verification process or photography questions that you might have, or if you have a certain problem that you have with a photo that you took and you're not sure why you had that problem, maybe I can answer that question. But at this point, I think we'll just open it up to questions unless Maureen, you have anything else that you'd like to share. We'll use the chat box for questions. So if you hover down toward the bottom of your screen, you should see a chat button that you can click on. Chris just wanted to point out that you can set cameras to record pictures at higher resolutions, uh, same with videos. 
um, and that allows you to view a higher quality photo later. Yes, uh, you can fit more photos on an SD card if you have it at a low resolution, but in my opinion, I always have them at the highest resolution settings because you never know when that high resolution photo is going to become important. So I take everything at the highest resolution I can. Um, Matt asked tips on when we should press plants for verification. Um, Matt, I would say that if you collect a curly leaf pond weed and you know for sure that's what it is, but you're just sending a picture to the DNR AIS coordinator for verification, uh, you probably don't need to worry too much about uh, pressing it if you just keep it in the fridge for a couple of days just to make sure that the coordinator doesn't need it. Um, then you probably don't need to worry about spending the, the time and the money on, on pressing the plant. If it's something that you want to keep around for your own purposes, then certainly that's the best way to preserve a plant. Um, but yeah, in general, uh, you shouldn't have to press them because they should be in, in perfectly fine condition for a few days in the fridge while you're waiting to hear back from the, the DNR AIS coordinator. And Michael that. says, what if the animal is so small it's hard to focus on even close up? I think the New Zealand mud snail is really small. It is, it's a, a matter of millimeters in length. So it's a very, very tiny snail. Um, in most cases, if you try to get close to something like that with a phone or something that doesn't really have much uh, magnifying ability to it, you're gonna be blocking out so much light that you're not gonna be able to see much of anything anyway. So um, with a, a mystery, uh, sorry, a New Zealand mud snail, the best thing to do is probably to put it on your fingertip and hold it up so that you get some light from the top and take a, a photo from the side. Did, so at least I, it's well can, lit. I need to interrupt here. Like there's in our verification guidance, which I'll make sure you guys have links to it. It's only for the common restricted species. When we have prohibited species, we do collect specimens for that. That's why you should always collect specimens. There's species specifically named in there that like, especially the prohibited ones and things like New Zealand mud snails, which you need the specimen. It needs to be dissected and looked at by an expert. And we kind of say that in there. So like for, like the photos are great for like Eurasian water mofo, curly pondweed, some of the snails, really for everything. That's why we say always collect a specimen too, and the DNR will let you know if we need a specimen too. Because there's some species you, we're just not gonna know. Yeah, with photo. yeah that's, that's a good point. Thank you yeah. for interrupting. So some of these specimens are gonna be so small or difficult to photograph that they're, they're just, it's not gonna work well for them anyway. And in the case, like Maureen pointed out, some of these species are prohibited and a specimen's required anyway. Uh, it's still nice to have a photo if you can take one, but it's not always gonna be real easy to do so. Uh, in the case of the New Zealand mud snail, in order to get a decent photograph of one, you really have to have a decent camera with a macro lens um, in order to get a decent shot. So um, that's just a tricky one, a tricky example. Um, Matt asked what the preferred naming system is for sending in photo files. Um, you know, some several years ago, I think we did have a naming convention, uh, Maureen, that we were asking for. I don't remember exactly what that is. Yeah, we do. I don't have it open. Um, so I don't want to mess it up. And that's, it is nice if like our partners can help with the naming convention. We can include that. Um, we can add it to the PowerPoint so that everybody knows for sure how we want that named. Thank you for asking. Sure. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, Chris mentioned you can place something larger next to it to allow the camera to focus, then remove the object and take the picture. Yeah, so that's a that's a good trick for um, taking a picture of something where there's a lot of distracting backgrounds because your camera is looking for areas of high contrast for the autofocus system to focus on. And it doesn't always guess the right thing if you have a busy scene. So one of the things you can do is I do this sometimes when taking pictures of a flower or something. I'll put my hand right next to the flower and then the camera sees my hand and it's such a dominant piece in the photograph that the autofocus will focus on my hand. I'll push the shutter bu button down halfway to lock the focus and then I pull my hand out and then I take the picture. So that's a way to sort of help the camera figure out where the focal point is. And uh, it, it's just a little trick that photographers use sometimes. Uh, Amanda posted the naming convention. 
in the example. So uh, she has the species code, the county, the date, the water body name, um, the water body ID code, and the collector's name. Thank you, Thank Amanda. You, And I don't know that like the citizens need to worry because might not know species codes and stuff, but like we can do that cleanup later. And I should also say it's okay if it goes to the county coordinator too and the county can clean stuff up and then send it to the DNR coordinator. It was just messy to include that in like guidance to be consistent. So it's easiest for us to say just send it to the DNR, but the county partners can help get it to the DNR too. Um, I don't see any more questions, but can you guys see my slides? Because I highlight a couple webinars that are yet to come. I think I'm sharing my screen. You are, yep. <laughs> okay, so these first two on the left side, the ID and the photo verification are complete. It was yesterday and today. Um, we'll be planning a webinar to review how to conduct solo monitoring, um, mainly for our DNR staff, but we'll also invite um, partners, citizens, whomever, um, will essentially be using the citizen protocols that we have um, for boat landing monitoring, um, like throwing rakes into the water, monitoring not clean boats, clean waters, um, and then a combination of like AIS snapshot day. Um, and we're doing that because it's safer to prevent the spread of coronavirus if we go out monitoring by ourselves and not as teams of people in boats. Um, so we'll just review that with everybody. Um, but we're pending on DNR's planning process because we're not starting phase one of the uh, Badger bounce back plan until June 1st, so that's next Monday. But then we aren't sharing with our staff our final recommendations for all monitoring, not just invasive species until June 8th. Um, so sometime after June 8th, we'll host that webinar. We're just to be determined yet. And then Paul, I don't know if you want to mention your aquatic plant ID. Sure. So every summer, uh, I partner with DNR and UW Trout Lake to host a couple of aquatic plant identification workshops. And we usually do these in person and have 70 or 80 species of live plants in the room. Uh, that obviously isn't going to work out very well this year with the group gatherings and such. So we're doing this virtually. It'll only be one day. Um, nine to one, we're going to run through similar rotations of what we would do with the hands-on workshops, but it won't be with live specimens this year. And um, that is open to everybody, to staff and to the public. We can have up to 300 people in the meeting. So if you are a CLMN volunteer, you received the, the links to these a couple of days ago. I believe it went out to the AIS coordinators listserv as well. So uh, you should have seen these. And Go ahead and register for that if you're interested in learning how to identify aquatic plants, both native and invasive species. Thanks, Paul. Let's see. Then I just had a slide here to show our con. Oh, oh! <laughs> I thought I had a slide for our, our contact information. Um, if anybody has questions, there's the email for me and Paul. <clears throat> and I'm going to send this in the link if you guys want to know where to find those fun songs that I was playing when we first started. Um, and here's what that website looks like. I'll go back to our emails, but that's it. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in through the chat, so we're all done. Thanks everybody for attending. I hope this was useful for you. Take care, bye guys.